This is Abe Freetanzer from CinemaDailyUS.com, and I'm thrilled to be speaking with Asin Nadim, the director of Crows Are White, which makes its world premiere at the South by Southwest Film Festival. How are you doing today, Asin? I'm doing great. I'm excited to be at South by. It's my first time in Austin, and uh, thanks for uh, having me. That's great. That's great. I'm sad not to be there in person this year, but I'm glad to kick off the, the fest with the opportunity to speak with one of the filmmakers of what I think is probably one of the more interesting films showing at the festival this year. Thanks for your kind words. <laughs> so it's it really is a very peculiar film, of course. And I did you have any sense of what it was going to be at the end when you first had the idea to start rolling your camera? I had... Um... No, <laughs> I had no idea what to expect. You know, the movie continuously evolved. It, even though I went there kind of uh, searching for answers, I didn't imagine I would end up filming my own life. Um, I never wanted my own biography to play a role and actually related very much to the secrecy of the monks that I was filming. Um, however, they were so opaque and secretive that uh, I just spent a lot of time on the mountain kind of questioning why I was there. And um, a major turning point was meeting uh, a very unexpected character, a monk who kind of defied uh, what most of us would imagine a monk would behave as. And uh, it was an unlikely friendship between us that kind of really changed the course of the film and uh, ultimately my life. Yeah, and he's such an interesting character, too, because it seems to me like, how could he still be a monk among all these other monks who know what he's doing? But maybe that's it. Maybe they don't really understand what he's doing because they don't do those things. Is that how it works? You know, yes, I think, you know, he uh, there's not that many monks on the mountain, but he was the lowest ranking monk. So he was still kind of working his way up to the ranks. And what was one of the most curious things about filming at the monastery was how bureaucratic it is. In some ways, the structure is very similar to a Japanese corporation. You know, you work for years before you gain, you know, earn the respect, and then you slowly kind of move on. Um, you know, what, what was interesting to me was that he defined those expectations and yet, um, had the most wisdom um, because he's kind of coexisting in our everyday life, but also in the monastic traditions of the mountain. Wow, no, it's it's just, it's so interesting. And I think there's also a real universality to religion here that, you know, you come from a Muslim background, you sought out this Buddhist monk, but I think that there's also I mean, to me, I'm I'm Jewish. I know that I'm someone I've I've had very good experiences with my faith. I haven't. I don't think I've struggled very much with it. But I think that it's always interesting to me when I see someone seeking out a religious teacher or figure from another faith. Uh, what do you think about that, and why that's something that really appealed to you? You know, I think I, I kind of touch upon that in the movie. Um, it, I found it easier to speak to somebody of, uh, outside my faith because my own religion brought up um, issues of guilt. And I, I figured that if I speak to an imam, uh, they might be giving me the answers that I already know, you know, but asking somebody of another faith, they'll ha maybe have a perspective that I, you know, I've not heard before. Um, so, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. But of course, you still had an imam perform your wedding ceremony. Yeah. And, you know, like these things, um, they're complicated, <laughs> you know? And I think that's one of the things that the movie touches on is this, um, it's not black and white, that issues of faith and your relationship to them, it's all tied in with how your parents, um, uh, you know, taught you how to have these relationships and that, you know, what was interesting to me was I am a person of faith and yet is, I struggle with trying to adhere to the rituals of my faith. You know, I don't pray five times a day. I might still believe in God, um, but I don't really perform all the rituals that are required of, from my faith. And maybe as a Jewish man, you might also 
you know, uh, relate to that. And yet uh, I have a lot of religious guilt uh, because, of, because of this. So I, I feel like there's a, hopefully a lot of people can kind of relate to the story. Um, and I think each person will take their own meaning based on their own experiences. Yeah, I do think that religious guilt also extends across all religions. I think it's, it looks different in terms of what those rituals are and how prescribed they really are. But I, I do think that that's something that can be pretty universal and that this film does a great job of, of showcasing. And it's not, for me, it's not even, you know, what was really startling to me was going there, seeing how uh, one of these, my main characters, Ryushin, is struggling to kind of balance the sacred with profane, you know? And um, I realized like his, his struggle and journey is kind of universal. He's trying to meet the expectations of his parents, his elders, his society. And I think that's something that we can all relate to how to kind of stay true to yourself um, without, you know, sacrificing who you are in the face of uh, the pressures from you know, your family or society. Yeah, and I do like your title also, which I think is supposed to be the, the definition of a contradiction, right? That crows are white, that it's something that we know is not true, but in the, if you can you just explain that a little bit for those who haven't seen the film? Um, well, it, it's from a story, from an encounter uh, with a senior monk at the monastery. And I ask him if monks ever question their faith. And his response was a story from his uh, past where his teacher would tell him uh, crows are white. And even though objectively he knew that that was incorrect because it was an answer delivered by his master, he had no choice but to agree with him. And it's some, a story that really resonated with me because my, my mother used to always say, even if your father is wrong, you have to agree with him, <laughs> you know? And it's kind of at the core of the, the story. Um, it's about my struggle with uh, my parental, you know, the pressures faced by, you know, from my parents and how I was expected to conform to a certain idea or practice, even though it kind of went against my core being. I know that the people at the monastery were not enthusiastic about you filming there. Were there portions of the film, whether with them or with members of your family, that you uh, chose not to include because people objected to them being involved? The monastery, uh, fortunately, you know, we ended in a very good relationship. Um, you know, we had a complicated relationship because I think the monastery, how I saw it, you know, they wanted the film as a vehicle to kind of promote their practice, which I, hopefully it does. Um, whereas I was more interested in kind of capturing um, the contradictions that we all live in, you know. For me, it's, it's beautiful that uh, they can do this incredible thing and still, um, I still have reverence for it. Uh, despite the contradictions, you know, because that's, for me, is how we, how we live, you know, it's never black and white, there's always these shades of gray, and um, yeah, uh, regarding my parents, there was a lot that we filmed that we debated on whether or not to include, um, especially at the very end, the, the kind of 10-year-old secret that I'm confessing to my parents, uh, but once I saw the footage, I knew I had to include it. And I'm, I'm glad I did because um, my father recently watched a movie and he said he's really happy at the fact that I filmed the act because it actually having cameras there tempered his emotional response. And over time that actually allowed him to have a more peaceful um, resolution to the events and how they unfolded. I like that. I also like the uh, storytelling style you have that there are a few moments where instead of, uh, there's a lot of translation involved and in some cases you sort of narrate over that and, and explain something. Is that something that you wanted to do just for the sake of the flow or because you wanted to represent you know, what was being said in a different way? 
a lot of it was for the flow and sometimes it was to kind of give my own point of view over what was being said. Um, I, I thought it was marvelous, like uh, when Ryushin's talking because he's oscillating between Japanese and English. And sometimes he mispronounces things, but it's a very charming and this unexpected poetry in how he, how he communicates. And I think that's just a, a wonderful byproduct of filming in a, a culture outside of your own. Yeah. Has he seen the film? He did. Uh, he saw the film recently and um, it was moving because uh, he was crying at the end and uh, very, he was very, very happy. And I hope that once the pandemic is over, I can actually uh, go to Japan and share it with the monks as well. That's really nice. What do you think their reaction will be to it? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm continuously surprised on this journey. Uh, I hope um, I hope they can celebrate it. You know, before I was leaving, um, one of the funniest moment was uh, the monks wanted to uh, invite me for a last minute meeting, and I was kind of scared. You know, I was like, they're, they're going to be upset about something, and they actually it was a very touching moment where they gave me Kamahori's prayer breeds. Uh, that he carried with him for seven years on his journey. And they said, all the monks on the mountain are praying that you win an Oscar. <laughs> Which I thought, you know, uh, uh, I was surprised. I didn't even know that they, uh, they knew what the Oscars were, <laughs> you know. That is funny. Well, of course, the first big audience to see this film will be at South by Southwest. How does it feel to be premiering the film there? I'm nervous, I'm excited. Uh, I think the thing that I'm most excited about is having a conversation with a live audience, um, especially since I feel like the few people that I have shown it to, they all um, have a different experience that they kind of bring to the table. Um, so I'm just gonna, you know, I'm excited to have that conversation. That's great. I also think there's just so much represented. There's Saudi Arabia, there's Ireland, there's Japan, there's, you're, you know, you're in LA, I believe, um, and then Texas. And so it's just a nice, you know, the whole, the whole world in a, in a certain sense. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's a good representation of how we all live. You know, these boundaries are eroding and we're all kind of traversing, uh, you know, uh, all, a lot of landscape, either digitally or physically these days. Yeah. Are you going to be in your next project? Uh, hopefully never, ever again. You know, I think I still, to be honest, it's still deeply uncomfortable to see myself on screen. And it's not something I intended. But, uh, you know, at a certain point, I realized it was very difficult for me to tell the story of the monks without telling my own. So and I hope the movies um, richer and more people can connect to the story. I do think so. Yeah. Do you have a next project already in the works? Um, I am writing a horror film right now. <laughs> um, yeah. Something, something to do with, with monks or religion or something altogether new? Um, I think n no, no monks, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I feel like a lot of my projects and movies, uh, deal with, uh, issues of faith in, in one shape or form. You know, I think you always tell stories that are uh, close to home and, um, uh, the kind of, the choices that uh, we're faced with are not clear cut, you know, and uh, they're ambiguous. Uh, and I think that kind of, that interests me, so. Well, that's great. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. Yeah. Uh, Cro Crows Are White premieres in the documentary spotlight section at South by Southwest. For more great content like this, subscribe to the Cinema Daily US YouTube channel. Thank you so much, Asin, and best of luck with this film and your future projects. Thanks so much, Abe, for having me, and I look forward to seeing you in the future. Sounds good. Enjoy South by Southwest. Take care. Bye.